Hello and welcome to a very special session of Digital Futures. This is part of our series, <clears throat> Robotic 3D Printing and Architecture, which itself is something of an innovation. What we're trying to do increasingly on Digital Futures is to introduce, uh, to, to, to put together uh, clusters of sessions into courses, as it were. We've already done several courses on AI, um, and this is a course on 3D printing and architecture, which potentially could be adopted as a course in schools of architecture. Today, it's very, we have actually, it's a very unusual session. It's the first uh, session in which we have focused on one particular very distinguished uh, designer. Um, we, in the past, we've had a series um, uh, called Legends, where we've interviewed some of the leading, more stately, elderly figures, shall we say, within the, the world of architecture, uh, Peter Eisman, Denise Scott Brown, and so on. Um, and Ron is a little too young for that, but certainly someone of a, an equal stature. Um, and it's a great delight to be able to have him here today. Um, so rather than having our, our usual uh, sort of panel, as it were, of, of contributors with um, fairly short presentations, we, we've invited Ron to give an in-depth presentation um, about his work. And we will be focusing and asking further questions about it as we as we go through. Maybe I could start by reading out the kind of the, the standard description before I give my own interpretation, my own um, uh, um, uh, uh, introduction to Ron. Um, Ron Rail is a designer uh, based in La Florida, Colorado and Oakland, California. The creative endeavors of his work blur the, the borders between architecture, art, technology, land-based practices and social justice. He writes books, forms startup companies, advocates for human rights at the US-Mexico border, creates software, invents novel materials and new forms of construction and designs buildings as an applied research enterprise. His studio is known globally for the Tita Tota Wall Project, a 40-minute guerrilla event on both sides of the US-Mexico border to unite families and communities. He co-founded the startup company For Us, which rematerialized what wood waste via 3D printing to produce beautiful end-use products and has in innovated the process for robotic construction of raw earthen, mater earthen materials. His work can be found in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, the London Mu Design Museum, LACMA, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Rennick Smithsonian American Art Museum. He is the chair of the Department of Art Practice and the Evil Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, perhaps I could offer my own particular interpretation. I, I mean, I'm... I'm I'm really taken stunned by by some of uh, Ron's work. I think it's extraordinary that we that he operates in so many different domains. Um, I would say um, <clears throat> that um, this at this stage, I think, in terms of of, of the development of these te new technologies in architecture, we we have to move beyond the, the 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 mere fetishization of the technologies themselves and think about them in a broader context. So many times, I see people coming up with effectively reinventing the wheel, doing something that's already been done before and claiming that they've done something terrific. Um, having worked with uh, Berokos Nevis many years ago, uh, who was doing many of this stuff, some of the early work, um, it's good to see people when they actually start making making technological breakthroughs. But it's especially uh, good to see work that is not just focusing on the technology, it's also breaking down social, political, economic, and indeed environmental barriers and, and addressing those concerns. I was um, especially impressed by the Tito Watoto wall project, the uh, uh, seesaw installation, um, this guerrilla installation at the US-Mexican border um, that was so smart. I, I wish I thought of it myself, um, to go in there and to have a project that kind of, in some senses, almost articulated the interdependency between these two different cultures, but articulated in such a witty and playful way, and yet a such a powerful and provocative way at a particular moment in history when we should really be embracing and breaking down borders rather than, than, than setting them up. And in fact, the, the, the way in which Ron has been doing this in many ways echoes the whole digital future project itself, especially when we went online and we managed to break through um, not just the physical walls of the classroom, but also the socioeconomic and political barriers that were keeping, um, preventing certain people from having access to, um, to, to important educational ideas. So Ron is a kind of disruptor, a disruptor of, 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 of not only literal walls, not, uh, borders, not only literal walls, but also the kind of 
the ways in which we have perceived borders that have uh, that have precluded the kind of the dialogues that, that should be going on. And in a world where we have still conflict, what digital futures attempts to do is to unite the world, to bring the world together, to share our resources and to overcome all sorts of divisions. It's therefore a great pleasure to, to have Ron here today. Um, I think that Ron is going in the future going to be recognized as one of those iconic, iconic designers who really um, established a new way of thinking about materials and about the, the, the social activism and many, many more things. Ron, it's, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much, Neil, for that really generous introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you everyone for the invitation and thank you for being here. I'm this this particular lecture is about earth architecture and robotic futures, but I'm going to talk about the the history of earth and architecture just a bit and maybe contextualize it as to why I'm operating in this with this material and in this way. And so I want to begin with maybe mankind's oldest building material, which is mud and the mud brick. <clears throat> and I come from a very long tradition of people building with mud and living in mud buildings. I, I could probably estimate that my family has lived continuously in buildings made of mud for over a thousand years. And even though I'm in the United States, I live in a very particular place where earth building is a long tradition. In fact, the oldest continuously occupied buildings made of mud in the Americas is just a few um, just a very short drive from my own family home, which is also made of mud. This is Taos Pueblo in Taos, New Mexico. And what's interesting about this landscape for me is that it also lies on the historic U.S.-Mexico border. So it's the borderlands of a previous history and the scars and memories of that borderland still exist. It exists in the architecture, the people, the language, the food, the culture. And so at Borderlands, there are they are a conflation of, of two worlds and sometimes many worlds. And it's in that conflation of worlds where there is beauty and violence and ridiculousness. And so I think you mentioned the teeter-totter wall. I think the teeter-totter wall embodies those ideas of, of violence and beauty and ridiculousness all at the same time. We can see a thousand year old building built here in Taos, New Mexico. We can see how westward expansion has affected uh, this landscape and brought tourists to this area to gawk at these marvels of architecture. And we can see how the US military has emulated those buildings, building them also out of mud in the same way and the same technology along that historic US-Mexico border. And we can also see how the morphology of buildings has changed historically with the coming of new people and new ideas and new technologies and new material systems to that borderlands. Here is a church that was built in the 1700s, entirely made out of mud and logs. Here is the church as it's photographed in the 1930s, and we see the addition of a roof made of lumber that was milled in a sawmill of corrugated rolled metal that was bought, brought by a train and made in a factory using industrial processes. We can see the addition of lime plaster. And today we can see that church and how it embodies a historic romanticization, but it also uses cement plaster. The earthen roof is now replaced for a tar roof and the front entrance isn't as grand anymore, but it has the materials and details of of, of systems that you might find at Home Depot, uh, metal flashing, four by four lumber, latex paint. And so we can see how this evolution of morphology related to earth is entirely affected by the hybridization of other technologies as well. And we can see how the hybridization of cultures actually begins to morph uh, these buildings as well. The interiors of these church, which are quite Baroque and quite vivid and quite bright, transformed the invention of the lowrider. The lowrider is the evisceration of the insides of these churches as people from these very small villages in what was once Mexico and now the United States drove off into the landscape to work in factories, to move to cities. And we can see how the demand for earth as a building material by those who romanticize the material and who want to build large adobe McMansions in the Southwest has created 
the technology of these large machines that move across the landscape, consuming the earth and leaving adobe mud bricks in their wake. And so this is kind of a, the context in which I operate in, in which worlds and technologies and people and ideas come together in these ways that I mentioned that are ridiculous, that are violent, that are, are beautiful. And it's a productive laboratory for me to think about both the history of earth and architecture and the future of earth and architecture. My practice has been involved in what we might call a traditional architecture practice, but using traditional materials. This is a house that my studio designed in Marfa, Texas, probably the first earthen adobe house constructed in that town in 100 years. It's a building that is a meditation on the relationship between earth and concrete, a traditional material and a modern material. And we can see how in the building, there is an embedded archeology span that one may discover in the future, bricks made in the United States at the bottom, which are darker and stronger, which are actually more expensive, um, and bricks at the top, which are less expensive, but more lightweight and more economically um, uh, feasible for the project. So there's an economy embedded in the section of the wall itself. And so we discover that this is a borderlands house, a borderlands house made of the geology across borders with two different kinds of soils that's negotiated by the material of concrete. It's a box of earth that holds inside a box of technology, the box of technology that holds modern plumbing, uh, modern heating systems, electrical systems. Expanding upon this idea of the borderlands related to earth, <clears throat> my studio also worked with the artist Elm Green and Dragset to design this project called Prada Marfa. Also a meditation on the borderlands because it is made of those two same materials, mud brick and a cement mortar, which is a material system that the United States military brought to the borderlands after the Mexican-American War. And it celebrates that in the section of, of the wall, but it also is a juxtaposition not only of materials that are in conflict perhaps, but they are uh, celebrating the juxtaposition and, and bringing to light the juxtaposition between wealth and poverty, uh, between Mexico and the United States, Mexican and American. And also this project entered into a new realm of how art and architecture is communicated. One, it blurs the boundaries between art and architecture. It's a building, it looks like a building, but you can't go in it. It's really a sculpture. It's a, a new kind of land art sculpture. And when Beyonce jumped in front of this building and posted this photograph to her Instagram account, it became a cultural object. It entered into a new sphere of how we communicate and think about architecture in the 21st century. And when the Simpsons traveled across country to visit Prada Marfa, it became more of a cultural icon that inserted itself into the ridiculousness of the sculpture itself and the commentary that that sculpture has on commerce and place, but also Homer made his own commentary because the reason they stopped at Prada Marfa is because he had to take, he had to use the bathroom behind the, the building itself. So my practice operates within these worlds, speculating on the future and not only for the sake of the technology and the beauty of the technology, but how it connects to the people and the landscape. We recently completed, after 15 years, an enormous project with, a, with my local community um, in the borderlands of Colorado, uh, where local community members volunteered to construct, to build over 40,000 adobe bricks over the last 15 years, to make this enormous labyrinth that is a space for contemplation and reflection and of coming together of the community to celebrate those settlers who arrived in this place after the Mexican-American War and the turmoil that existed after the Mexican-American War that brought people to this place from many different parts of the world and many different parts of that local region. This is a space where we speak about the history of indigeneity, the history of uh, colonial practices, and the history of the westward expansion of the United States into this place.
And so my relationship to earth is intimate, it's historical, and I'm a steward of about 14 Adobe buildings that I'm currently rethinking, reimagining, and healing and telling the stories of these buildings. I invite people to learn about these traditional and indigenous building practices to restore and heal these buildings, teaching them about these heritage practices of building with earth and bringing them together around not only the cultural practice of building, but all of the practices associated with earth and building from growing food to cooking food. And the making of these mud ovens has been an essential part of my practice and a historic part of my own family traditions of cooking in these and also bringing these technologies back to the U.S.-Mexico border to build community in migrant shelters. Uh, this is one that was constructed in Nogales uh, a couple of years ago that is feeding that, that migrant shelter and through the production of over 150 loaves of bread uh, every two days. And I'm also thinking about the future of these practices, the future of making a cooking technology that migrated to the Americas 400 years ago, and what it means to implement these as a form of social practice that re-enters into spaces where cooking technology is needed very quickly. So I'm working with the American Refugee Committee to think about how we can make digitally fabricated inflatable mold formwork to make these hornos, these mud ovens much faster uh, and connect communities to this making process. Much of these thoughts and uh, even works are documented in a book I wrote in 2008 called Earth Architecture. In that book, it speaks about Earth as a modern building material. It features architects such as Rick Joy and Heiken and Komonen. It talks about Le Corbusier's relationship to building on Earth and Frank Lloyd Wright's relationship to building with Earth and many of the modern architects that didn't abandon those Earth building traditions at the dawn of modernism, but kept them while thinking about a new kind of language and a new kind of technology influenced by the industrial revolution that led them to be masters of steel and glass and concrete. And I feel that today we are embarking on that same kind of new threshold moment in the world of architecture where we are moving from particular traditional practices that related to the industrial revolution and now moving into practices related to additive manufacturing and other sort of parametric tools of design and fabrication. And so in that last chapter of the book, Earth Architecture, I speculate on what the future of earth and architecture is. And I talked about how people around the world who are invested in earth heritage practices were connecting through the internet. And I also talked about Berkov Koshnevis, who you mentioned earlier, Neil, who was one of the early uh, innovators and pioneering leaders of additive manufacturing and architecture. And he sought a way to 3D print with concrete. However, in his very early works, and because he comes from a heritage practice in Iran of building in earth, he was using clay as the material to do the tests so he doesn't clog up his machines. And while he would, his goals were about concrete, it inspired me to think that the future of additive manufacturing and construction was not concrete, but in fact, earth. And I embarked on a journey to see if that was possible back in 2008 and nine. And I call that project Emerging Objects. And Emerging Objects' initial goal was to see if we could 3D print clay. And it came from a set of philosophies that was to invent materials for 3D printing that were affordable and strong and come from localized sources, just like earth building. And to create assembly methods that do not require specialized skill, like building with earth, but also to create platforms for hardware and software that place added manufacturing within reach. And to consider that connection between pre-industrial, industrial, and digital craft technologies. And so in 2009, my studio, Emerging Objects, embarked on 3D printing clay, taking the oldest additive manufacturing method that we had, which is building with mud, the soil beneath our feet, and thinking about how that could be transformed in the 21st century using these technologies. So some of the, so these are some of the first 
3D printed clay objects ever printed in the world. Um, I have to acknowledge Professor Mark Ganter at the University of Washington, who taught me many of these skills that allowed me to 3D print with clay. And so these are objects from 2009 that were just experiments and reflections on what might happen if we can 3D print clay. I did not know what any of these used were useful for. They were really parametric experiments. But also I began to ask questions about, well, what does this mean for the making of architecture? Could you make ceramic bricks in a new way, for example? Could you 3D print air spaces into ceramic objects that create insulation? Could you make new kinds of cooling systems that absorb water within the wall and ventilate to create new kinds of swamp cooling systems that were part of the tectonic? This, these innovations and this new knowledge of how to do this enabled me to think about different materials that were available in the landscape, such as salt, which is widely available here in the San Francisco Bay Area because of these salt crystallization ponds that produce thousands of tons of salt using only wind and sun every year. And emerging objects developed a salt material for 3D printing. And because it was so inexpensive and available, we were able to speculate on assemblies on printing much larger objects than at that time were possible because of the cost prohibitiveness of 3D printing at that time. Uh, today, it's quite common to print an object that large and it's not that expensive, but at that time, it was incredibly expensive. So these innovations came out of trying to overcome the expense of materials. And so many of our projects were looking at what it means to build from these landscapes and how to be inspired by these landscapes. So this, we, this project called Salty Glue uh, titled because it involved salt and glue, uh, was made to think about how we can research ways of very quickly producing mass difference to create shelters and environments. So these are all experiments about how to um, how to build using new kinds of technologies, new kinds of materials we're developing. And this just allowed us to expand our repertoire from salt to wood, taking into account the 7 billion tons of wood waste that are produced each year in the United States by the construction industry and transform that into a 3D printable material. This material was quite successful yeah, and, and strong and beautiful. It allowed us to form a very novel company that we call Forest. Uh, Forest is, was an endeavor that sought to think about how we can reclaim sawdust rather than utilize forest for the production of wood products. And this company is now part of the desktop metal uh, family of, of companies. Um, we can produce very high quality wood parts made out of reclaimed and upcycled sawdust. And there's actually now a wood uh, forest edition shop system machine that's commercially available you know, for binder jetting wood technology. What's, what's interesting to me, and this is this relates to this concept of borderlands of the of the kind of ridiculousness in some ways, but the beauty of it, the beauty of it is as salvages as wood. What's really interesting to me about this as a technology is that in some ways it beautifully emulates the wood grain because of the layers of the additive manufacturing process. But it also, um, we can print wood grain. So much of the wood grain that you see in this is actually printed through a darker ink binder uh, to make the, the wood grain in some of those objects like you see here. And here we're actually coloring that wood grain slightly. So other materials are like cement. We haven't uh, denied cement, but we wondered, uh, can we produce cement with less water and not using any formwork? And we developed a material, uh, a patent material system that can use very little water to make very complex forms using cement. And this is the largest object, but we're always thinking about how those technologies and those forms come from the origins of thinking about building with earth and the materials um, and technologies and forms and beauty that are associated with earth building cultures. 
recycled tires was another material we developed and then hybrid materials chardonnay grape skin mixed with cement um just kind of ridiculous formulas that we we shared with the world in a book called printing architecture innovative recipes for 3d printing because many people saw us as material scientists but we have no expertise in material scientists we're really cooks in the kitchen uh, and that's why we wrote this book as a recipe book so that others might be able to uh, follow in our footsteps and create novel new materials for additive manufacturing. That journey was a deviation that took my studio to beautiful places of discovery. In 2016, the studio returned to think about clay and returned to that material by thinking about not the material itself, but the way that the material would be deposited through a machine. And we created these very novel forms that use ceramic in its raw form. And it seems that the world had not seen these kind of forms. These were all tests of material depositions, but at that time were extremely novel and took us into um, a world of printing in ceramics. And we made several ceramic objects. We lectured in ceramic uh, events and, and um, became very closely associated with the craft world of ceramics. Um, this led us to produce a lot of beautiful objects and interesting conversations and meet many people around the world who, uh, who, who were working in that field of 3D printed ceramics but had not explored these kinds of textures necessarily and these kinds of possibilities, which are very common today but originated uh, here at Berkeley using ways of rethinking G-code. So G-code clay, though, was a series of experiments to think about how we might scale up and what it meant to scale up these processes by giving clay additional strength by weaving the material together, by corrugating the material so that uh, a, a straight line of clay is quite weak, but a curved line of clay is quite strong, just like we would see in corrugated metal or a masonry wall. And so there was a political dimension to this work as well, as there always is. It's difficult to extract the land itself without thinking about the land. Bad Hombres in 2017 was commentary on President Trump's uh, statement that there were bad hombres at the border. Uh, the word hombre in Spanish means bad men, but because Trump doesn't speak Spanish, he said there were bad hombres. And an hombre is a color gradient between light and dark. And so we created the series called Bad Hombres, which used light and dark clays from two different regions of the United States, a Republican place and a Democratic place, to demonstrate how there was a oneness and a sameness, but also a difference and a distinction that could be found in material place and the people itself, just as in the borderlands. This inspired me to think about how can we scale this up and return to think about using the land itself. The first experiments involved a project called Future Ruins, where we invited 25 ceramic artists from Juarez, Mexico and El Paso, Texas. We worked with the ceramics department at the University of Texas, El Paso, as well as their geology department to look for clays along the US-Mexico border on both sides and discovered a range of complexions of clays from sources that were historical, from new sources that we just discovered behind a subway, you know, behind it, like a 7-Eleven. And, and we gathered those clays and we, we created this software, which we call Potterware. And Potterware was a software that enabled ceramic artists who had never 3D modeled anything, did not know how to use a slicer, did not know how to use a 3D printer, and they could quickly begin to create objects um, for 3D printing ceramics. And we tested them with those initial 25 ceramic artists and they produced 250 beautiful ceramic objects using the earth from the borderlands itself. And it became this like international uh, ceramic uh, coming together around place, around land and around technology. And these are some of those objects. In that same exhibition, we began to speculate, oh, this is, okay, different slide. <clears throat> this idea 
of making structures with the land itself was furthered by this exhibition called Without Hands. Uh, I won't try to pronounce the French version, Saint Le Mans. Uh, and to think about what it means to create ceramics without hands. We took a very different approach for this exhibition. We did not 3D print with clay for this exhibition. Rather, we asked if we could harvest clay from the local source in Limoges, France, and we built an armature. Because in this region of France, there was a tradition of wattle and daub. This is um, making woven wooden branches together that's infill in the wall of architecture, and you would apply mud to those woven wooden branches. So we took the technologies that we developed in G-code clay, and we applied it to bioplastic to create a meshwork onto which we could apply the clay to allow these very thin panels of translucent plastic to become very rigid through the application of the local clay using a traditional project process of just applying it by hand. And so the outcome was this, <clears throat> uh, a structure that is a hybrid technology of traditional earthen plastering and additive manufacturing and celebrates those two material practices and in, in technologies in different ways. So how do we create habitats and for whom do we create habitats? We've created a number of habitats for not only people, but also animals. Um, for example, this artificial bird's nest working with scientists who are attempting to create new habitats for this bird that is whose habitat is endangered because of sea level rise. And there were particular programmatic requirements uh, that had to do with privacy, with safety, security, access by scientists, and we created a series of uh, uh, prototypes for these bird nests that are being tested on this small island off the coast of San Francisco. Yeah, and they've been in place for a number of years with a lot of success. Um, so not only birds, but we've been working and I'm continuing to work with Secor International. And we made this relationship because they discovered that we could 3D print with many different kinds of materials. And they asked our studio if we could print with calcium carbonate. The reason they asked us that is not because calcium carbonate is a good material for uh, restoring coral reefs. It's actually not. But they wanted to demonstrate how calcium carbonate, which is what coral excrete and what coral often build upon after that, is degraded by increased pH levels because of global warming. And so from these scans of coral, we printed with calcium carbonate, these coral examples as a teaching tool. But when they came into the studio and saw these wild textures of the ceramic, they had recognized the plausibility of those structures to be used for um, coral larvae reproduction. And so we created about 3,000 of these larvae seed units out of 3D printed ceramic using both jet binding and uh, paste extrusion to create these small seed units where at least one coral larvae will develop within the, the niches of these textures in safe environments that if they tumble on the ocean, the, the, the center of those coral environments is protected. And so these are being tested all over the world now with, with a tremendous amount of success to the extent that um, I'm right now actively involved in the production of 2,000 more using a, a different design that takes on different challenges for different kinds of uh, sea environments. That's I love that project so much. So not only animal habitats, but habitats for... Um, human animals. The Cabin of 3D Printed Curiosities was a project in 2018 that allowed emerging objects to explore many of these technological innovations and material innovations all in one project. A small house that responded to the relaxation of building codes in the San Francisco Bay Area because of the housing crisis. 4,000 3D printed ceramic shingles that are all based on a single 
digital file, but are all different because of the way they are printed. And this kind of wiggly print allowed each of the ends of this to kind of move ever so slightly as if they were all custom manufactured. The front facade has Chardonnay grape skin, um, waste, sawdust waste, cement, and holds an ecology of plants that grow very well in the San Francisco Bay Area environment. The clay is, is harvested locally, and it was also waste clay from ceramic labs in the Bay Area. The interiors are bioplastic made out of bamboo, celebrating the translucence embedded with uh, low wattage LED lights in a small space that transforms from a place to, to lounge and live to a place for sleeping. And many, much of the furniture uh, and all the furniture is 3D printed as well, the coffee table, the chairs, the light fixtures. The, the coffee cups made out of coffee, the coffee pot made out of coffee. But the aspirations never ended to think about how we can scale production. And our aspirations continue to think about how we might achieve this goal of using these corrugations uh, to make strength, to produce much larger objects. And it demanded that we leave the world of material innovation and the world of software innovation and now enter in the world of hardware innovation. So because of my relationship with the ceramic manufacturer that had been printing these, making these printers that we've been using since 2016, I sent the sketch to him and asked if we could produce a very inexpensive machine that simply did this, this um, a polar printer. And we developed this printer over the course of about a year and a half. And the outcome was this printer, which is now commercially available. It's a low cost printer that could print many objects at once, but could also print a very large object made out of aluminum, uh, using simple parts, using uh, uh, SCARA uh, mathematics, which has been around since the 1980s. And I also had to think about how we can scale up the, um, we could scale up the material quantities that we needed for scaling and for making architecture using this robot. And so, so these are some of the early tests of 3D printing with clay at a very large scale. Because I don't like this sound, but I'll here's here's the here was the vision of that, that we could use this scare robot to print a new kind of architecture made out of local uh, soils. And so these visions um, <clears throat> were tested through and required in a very modest way to develop materials that were inexpensive, to develop a software that was very accessible and to develop hardware that was portable uh, and inexpensive and could be transported into remote environments where we could produce architecture. And so these visions and these processes were finally tested in a project called Mud Frontiers in 2019. And Mud Frontiers was the first time uh, on the planet when Adobe was deposited in the borderlands where it had been built for thousands of years using robotic systems and robotic technologies. A series of research projects and explorations that were prototypes for architecture. There were prototypes for making spaces that explored the structural possibility of the material. Rather than adobe, which is very thick, we can make very adobe that was very thin, a, a two and a half meter structure whose wall thickness is only um, 75 millimeters thick. Also ways of thinking about um, architectural components. How does one 3D print a stair? thinking about how we can translate thickness, the, be the beauty of thickness that earthen architecture has into thinness and insulation rather than thermal mass. Think about how we can produce 
those same objects, not in electric kilns or gas kilns, but we can produce ceramic objects made from the soil itself in the local region in wood fire kilns and, and 3D printing a kiln out of this technology. New kinds of structural possibilities, textural possibilities that hybridize the material relationships and instructions. So these sticks were placed to tie two walls of adobe that were printed together and were instructed by the curvature in the wall itself, for example, and to create new kinds of programs and spaces for architecture, furniture, places for sitting, the, the most fundamental of architectural components, the hearth. <clears throat> COVID during the pandemic was an incredible opportunity to completely extricate the studio from the studio itself, from the laboratory and move it out into the landscape. And during the pandemic, the landscape became the laboratory. The landscape became a place of possibility for exploration. No longer were we confined to the laboratory as the place of exploration, but we we're actually forced out of the laboratory because the, the studio closed down, <clears throat> you no longer come together. And so this became a return to these borderlands to explore this uh, much more deeply. Uh, what thinks of ways of making tributed openings without any lintels to approach the making of arches and domes and vaults. And to think about how these novel technologies of making a low cost three axis printer could turn into a four axis printer by moving and by moving the robot to different locations so we could print allow the material to dry and print to create cellular spaces that have begun to approach architecture in a much more robust way to create rooms, basically rooms that were made from the soil itself of the borderlands landscape. That project <clears throat> we entitled Casa Covida um, started in 2019, and Casa Covida was a place for cohabitation during the time of COVID. Covida isn't really a word. Covida sounds like COVID. Covida sounds like co-living. Uh, but it's a place for uh, two people in a remote environment during the pandemic to come together in a space for sleeping, a space for warmth and gathering and cooking, in the pottery that was printed from that landscape and fired in that landscape. And a place for bathing, for soaking and meditating on not only the landscape and the earth itself, but also the sky. And in this hybrid approach to thinking about architecture, <clears throat> I wondered what kind of roof could be attached to an earthen building that related to this relationship to sky and we explored the idea of a pneumatic roof, one that imparted this incredible new quality of light to these spaces, it was sort of like a cherry on top of this beautiful chocolate sundae. And also, as I mentioned, is this meditation in this dark sky environment on thinking about our relationship to the earth and sky. And this is very important to me. Many, many of our projects are looking at materials counter to those materials that have degraded the, degraded the landscape, such as plastics and cement, which have had enormous environmental impacts. And so thinking about that relationship between earth and caring for that earth is embedded in these projects. Following Casa Covida, uh, I was invited to consider a land art project at a place called the Frontier Drive-In, which is along that historic frontier of the United States and Mexico in Southern Colorado. And the Frontier Drive-In is a restored 1955 drive-in movie theater, a new kind of hybrid technology for, or hybrid program for watching movies in the, in the 50s. And it was abandoned in the 80s, but in its restoration, we were invited to make this land art project, but to kick it off, we hosted a Borderlands Film Festival um, to have these conversations about what was the contemporary border and what was the historic uh, US-Mexico border. 
This landscape is unique because it is a high alpine desert environment. There's enormous aquifers underneath this ground. And there are many center pivot sprinklers that suck that water out of the ground to grow crops, such as potatoes and wheat and barley. Uh, wheat stock and barley stock are used in making the adobe that uh, we make for the 3D printing, but it spins around in a circle, very much like the Scara printer. And those crops are held in silos, such as these that are all over that landscape as well. These circular buildings that reflect the circular landscape in which they're grown. So the project was building on Casa Covida, but I saw these not as silos, but as silos that hold the sky. Not as, not as silos that hold grain, but silos that hold the sky. So the pro project was entitled Skylos. And Skylos was completely this meditation, this dark sky environment for observing the sky during the day and the night. Eight chambers for viewing the stars. in a project entirely constructed out of local soils using lots of energy in terms of physical energy, but very few bodies. So you can see here the construction set up the pump, the robot over here to the left printing. And my team simply um, watching the process unfold. There are times of intense labor and times of, of, of just, it's like a security guard job in some ways. It's like until something exciting happens, everybody's just watching the production. Over the course of that year that I was working on Skylos, I had this incredible opportunity to work with another team to build what I envisioned as a much more robust way to uh, make earthen architecture that was still portable allowed us to access remote landscapes, um, but allowed us to build objects larger than the robot itself. <clears throat> and so uh, with 20 Editor Manufacturing, we developed this, this uh, industrial robot on the back of a 25 foot long trailer that could be taken to any environment and using the soils of that environment, 3D print uh, objects that are incredibly large because the printer can print all around itself and can print several meters high. My latest project, which we completed this summer, pushed the idea of what was possible. The prior, we were using a three-axis printer, and now we had a seven-axis printer. So we looked back into the history of architecture at a technology that I've always been inspired by, which was to print not only the walls of earth and architecture, but the roof using earth. This is a technology developed in Sudan and Southern Egypt for the production of parabolic vaults that do not use any formwork. It usually relies on a wall in which mud bricks are leaned against and you extrude out a parabola from that wall by stacking them at an angle. You can see it uh, illustrated here in these photographs. There's one mud brick and then a few mud bricks that are leaning against the wall. Ultimately, those continue to stack and move outward to create enclosure. So using the, the seven axis capabilities of the robot, we certainly couldn't print at that steepness, but at a 30 degree angle, we were able to achieve starting at the ground, building up to an apse, and later to a parabolic form, an extrusion of earth that allowed us to <clears throat> print. For the first time that I know, the first 3D printed roof that was printed on site, and not only on site, um, but using materials that come directly from the site itself. I call this project 
Terrano. Terrano is, there, there's an architectural typology in this region because it's quite cold in the winter called a Soterrano. Soterrano is an underground, um, in English, maybe a potato cellar, or, a, or a, I think maybe that's a good, it's a, it's a, a root cellar that uses the earth itself to keep uh, vegetables over winter from freezing. And so Terrano reverses and inverses that technology to build a space sheltered by the earth above ground. Not only the floor itself, but the walls and the roof are made entirely out of earth. And here's a quick walkthrough of that finished project. While very humble, it also represents for me an incredible leap in our technological capability to envision what the future of Earth might be. Um, and so I'm thinking about this and what the possibilities are. I embarked on a new venture called Muddy Robots, thinking about the Smithsonian's Smithsonian Magazine's prediction during their 40 year anniversary about the the 40 most important things you should know about the next 40 years. And the number one thing they predicted was that sophisticated buildings would be made out of mud. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ron. That was, that was extraordinary. What a, what a journey. What a journey. Um, <clears throat> I was particularly the last project, um, I'd seen obviously illustrations of it and things, and that actually was very similar to something that Barack was thinking about. Um, well, I'm not sure it was the Sudan Sudanese examples, but he was definitely thinking about how you could uh, 3D print a vault in that way and was using these ancient techniques or, or examples of what might happen. I, I don't think he ever got around to doing it, but but you realized it. And I think that's, uh, that's remarkable. That was, that was remarkable. I was left thinking, it was kind of like, in a way, um, there were two. Well, I mean, the first thing I, I was left thinking was, is uh, in terms of definitions, we're talking about borders and definitions and breaking down borders and, and so on and so on. I, I was kind of intrigued by by the, the one of the titles you have is you like is, is a professor of art practice or something. You know? And I and I, it struck me that you know, how would you define yourself? What is I mean because it, it it's so all encompassing. It's it's old and new. It's kind of it's you're you're bringing everything together. It's a difficult. Uh, and maybe that's architecture. Maybe that's what architecture should be in some ways. Um, but I, I was. Yeah, I don't know. People, yeah. Sorry. People, people ask me to define myself. Are you an artist? Are you an architect? And maybe, maybe the answer is I'm a borderline citizen. I'm a person that moves between worlds, and I, I am the chair of a department of art, and I am uh, a professor in architecture, and I have that great luxury to experience the differences uh, between both worlds and to think about their connections of coming together. Hmm. No, I was just thinking as I was in Art Basel this last, well, last it's still going on, I think, um, in Miami Beach and uh, how do you, how do you define art? And, and and too often it becomes mere decoration and uh, and also the technology, there was, there was very little contemporary, I mean, no, it through AI hardly and uh, nothing new at all in, in, in what it was doing. So, the world of art, I kind of think of being a little decorative, but what you're doing is about more like a material, material behaviors in many ways. It's a, well, I, I guess it's, it's a question of definitions and how you define anything. Um, but that brings me to my second question, which is, which is what I thought was intriguing about your, your, your discourse is that um, you only, I think only mentioned the word environmental once. Um, and yet, everything is completely environmental um and it's again it's something that's fetishized by a lot of people these days as a kind of issue and it, it kind of interested me how you just absorb it into your way of operating so it's not nothing special it's just what you do you lose you, you use local materials um uh, in an important way and i think this is one of the one of the issues about environmental uh sort of sustainability is is often people overlook the the kind of um in, embedded carbon in, in in simple transportation of materials. I mean, I had a co some colleagues from the University of Nottingham years ago, Robert and Brenda Vale, who were one of the original green architects, and they were very 
you know, happy with their buildings in terms of the going off grid and so on. But the the the, the triple glazed windows have been flown in from Norway, you know, and, and that needs mm. to be put into the into the calculation and to be able to use, you know, the materials at hand on a particular site is is um is extraordinary. Do do you? I mean, how do you how do you relate to the kind of environmental concerns? I mean, how do you see that as from, from your your practice point of view? Um, <clears throat> that's that's a good question, Neil. You know, I I guess I do not fetishize it or talk about it so much because it's a little bit inherent to um, being a I would call it, say a land based practitioner. And what, what I mean by that is that I come from a heritage practice of being very connected to that landscape. So it wasn't like I was existing in a world that didn't understand our relationship to the landscape or the environment, and then returned to that. And I was like, wow, this is what we should be doing. I came from a world where, um, for example, my, my parents didn't have electricity till 1969. And so to to grow up in my grandparents' world, where they were still living in a culture without um, running water or or electricity, and it was very novel to them, we still practicing a world where you were more connected to the landscape, pumping water or using an outhouse and understanding what happens to the outhouse or what happens to the water and the water tables and recognizing the importance of snow melt and the weather. These were all very much part of my, my upbringing uh, and, and continues to be. And so I don't, I, I guess I don't think about the environment as something that has been discovered that we need to protect. It was always something that was revered um, and so uh, this is this is maybe why I don't I don't talk about it. And often I don't like to be um, pigeonholed in that. You know, a, a lot of people say, "Oh, you you must be part of the natural building movement or the green building movement." And I, and I, I you know, I pr I appreciate that, but I also feel that this is this is a new kind of movement. I I would like to think it's a it's a new approach to thinking about how. I, I use this word often, a heritage practice, how heritage practices or people who are connected to heritage-based traditions can operate in a 21st century. I showed the lowrider, for example. The lowrider was a moment where those heritage, those, those heritage-based tra practices transferred themselves through symbology and iconography onto a new technology that allowed people to participate in the 20th century and post-World War II practices. How do people who have been connected to earth-based practices and architecture operate in the 21st century when what they do in the morning isn't go outside and look at their crops and tend to their building, but in fact wake up, get in a car, and drive to their place of employment and are not and are distanced from that? I'd I'd like to think that the robot is a way to reintroduce and re-legitimize earth and construction practices in a 21st century context that allows us to take advantage of the the beauty of those technologies for their thermal mass characteristics for all the things that the natural building movement is interested in and do it in a way that's sophisticated i don't think i've demonstrated that yet i've made a lot of experiments but those are those are my goals in architecture the other thing that struck me is i mean i some time now since I was working with Baroque and various, various projects, but the, I mean, oh, what you find inevitably in any 3D printing, especially with the concrete, is that things don't go to plan. Um, there's sump, you know, and you, you could, there's a digital model, but what comes out and, and what, you know, the 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 effect of gravity on, 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 on everything is, is often not quite that so you have to correct it in some way and trying to get towards a perfection i mean i, I see that uh <clears throat> Mandy Jasha now has a some optical device that then corrects and then adds a layer to <clears throat> make up for any um deficit in some way but in some senses what you're doing is working with those imperfections allowing for those imperfections um rather than trying to get it right you're saying well what comes out of the process um is that correct, or, or how would you say? Absolutely. In fact, G-Code Clay, back in 2016, was all about the glitch. 
it questioned the idea that what was coming off of the computer screen was a perfect object. And the goal of the 3D printer was to uh, reproduce what was on the screen. And in fact, what was more interesting are the glitches that occurred. So I think this came about first when there were air pockets in the clay and there was a small explosion that caused these textures. And I thought how beautiful those textures that exist because of those small explosions. What if we begin to accentuate that? And so those glitches became a part of the process that gave way to understanding that those glitches could improve improve the structural capacity of the of the object that was made. And so I I don't I I know about uh, Kushnevis's um, uh, visions for three D printing vaults and and domes. I don't think they would be achieved by the economy of 3D printing with concrete because it's very expensive. And so you can't make thicknesses. The, the reason I've been able to print vaults and domes is because I'm wiggling back and forth to give enough surface tension to hold one layer to the other as it's on a slope. And so I also probably, and that would be ex very expensive because you're increasing the, the linear distance of the material. I'm using a lot of material to make this. And also you probably saw in that, that aerial view when I'm closing the cap on that vault, that some of the material is falling. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. You might've seen in one photograph that we had complete, we had printed another vault that completely collapsed. What we did with all that material is we ground it back up and put it back into the printer. There was no waste. If you visit any 3D printed concrete site, there's an enormous amount of waste that's just going to the landfill because printers still don't work very well. There's a lot of failures. And so we can recycle all that material and there's no chemical reaction. So that which we don't use can return to the soil. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't notice the collapse building, but I, I assume there must've been along the way, a few, a few questions, a few um, uh, structural um, issues. Um, one just on that line, I mean, um, with the question of the, um, with Barok's work, it, the, the, he was using rapid hardening cement, which would basically allow it to great, to gain sufficient um, <clears throat> um, structural strength to print the layer above. Um, when you're dealing with straight clay, that's never going to happen. So how does that operate? I mean, how does it gain, how do you see, how does it gain its strength over time? Um, or how do you, how do, how would you understand that process? Sure. Well, the, <clears throat> the material has a certain robustness to it. Um, it's more viscous, it's more sticky, and it has a, a matrix of natural fibers inside of it. So it allows it to be stacked uh, a certain height. And then we have to allow that to dry. The larger the structure I print, the more dry it will be when the printhead returns to that original spot. Um, if it's sunny, if it's windy, I can print a lot. If it's rainy and cloudy, I can print less. But ultimately, everything I've been doing is in regions that are that are sunny and dry, uh, obviously. And that, those are places more associated with earthen architecture. Um, but it's not the only place in the world that's associated with earthen architecture. We can find earthen architecture in Norway. We can find it in the tropics. There's just different uh, building systems that accommodate that material. But ultimately... It's about allowing the material to dry enough that you can continue to stack upon it. And that knowledge also comes from heritage-based experiences. Um, it's something we can quantify maybe uh, through, uh, through scientific experiments, but we also... Uh, can't rely on science in an environment that's constantly changing, where the clouds are moving, where rainstorms come in, where and so you have to rely on observation. You have to rely on touch. You have to rely on smell, uh, and these are very important things that um, I think are often factored out of architectural building practices. No one goes and smells the steel to see if it's ready to attach more steel, but we we do this to the earth. We think about it like, okay, this is ready for more. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> let's, I just want to mention that if there are any questions from in the YouTube, um, please forward them and we can pass them on. One, one final question for me. I was, I mean, <clears throat> I, you mentioned the fiber in 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 the clay, and uh, um, and that that could be obviously used as a, has a tensile capacity and helps in some sense. But mm -hmm. but I guess also it's a it's a challenge to make sure that you, the the clay you're getting has 
of sufficient quality to be used. Is there a refining process or does it just come as it is out of the ground? Or, you know, is there a way of... <clears throat> because I say, you know, with, with Barack, I mean, it was, there was a lot of work. To so I mentioned him a lot. I don't mean to do this, but uh, yeah. he worked with a French uh, concrete company, Lafarge, to try and get ideal cement for his uh, concrete. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, this is um, this is heritage-based knowledge. This is traditional knowledge. And so I I learned how to access these soils and understand what soils will work. And there's a whole range of soils that can work for this process based on learning from my father, learning from elders in my community, uh, what those materials might be and what their ranges are. And again, we, we can test them with our hands. We can test them through observations. We don't need scientific equipment. And so in that range, there's, there's a large range of heterogeneous soils, right? Everything that exists in the construction industry is homogenized so that we can apply a measure to it. Lafarge will say, well, this, this particular concrete will always be 3000 PSI in compression and have certain tensile strengths that are, that are standardized. We can achieve uh, a range of nearly standardized um, compressive strengths of Adobe simply through observation and simply through understanding where we might quarry those soils on site and testing them and doing some drying tests and tests with our hands. And, and so I, I probably should become more scientific, but I'm, I'm holding on to knowledge that allows me to develop these experiments quite rapidly for proof of prototyping, because I think that if I, given my limited resources, if I simply uh, did scientific analysis and testing that would slow down this process so much and i think much of uh the production of the work that i've been able to accomplish over the last 10 years has because is because i'm interested in the possibility of failure and embarking on say making something and allowing it to fail rather than uh, testing it for so many years and never producing it and and i i respect uh brock so much and I, I know him quite well and i and i think that many people with those kind of innovations spend a lot of time proving and then other people follow in their footsteps and and do and i i wish that he was seen in the world of concrete 3d printing as the as the pioneer uh because i see so many 3d printing companies who have who have uh, stood on his shoulders without acknowledging uh his his um, contributions no oh, absolutely i don't know if you know there's a company in uh, in shanghai that uh, he presented to because i invited him to shanghai and uh, anyway um and they copied him but even he was delighted because they the, the kind of the the zigzaggy reinforcement um that he conceptualized they proved that it worked and i mean so you also use the same technique so in some sense he wasn't he wasn't upset about that but but you're absolutely right i mean that he was working with certain techniques in a very sophisticated way such as the nozzle for example i mean once you've got a, a kind of material that's in suspension you can very easily squeeze all the liquid out of it if you mm -hmm. don't have the right nozzle and he was very very precisely working with that um my, I think his, his problem though was he, he was he was too careful about what he was doing and, and was not mm. in, engaging with others enough and he, and I maybe lost that advantage as other people started catching up. But I think his his contribution has to go down in history as a very very significant one. We're getting a few questions in from the from the chat. Ipsita has got one. Maybe I actually could, she's on the Zoom link, so maybe Ipsita, you could ask your question. Yeah. Hi. So this the first question is from me. So I really respect how you have maintained the heritage connection to the advanced methods of work construction. But my question is, do you believe that there can be a vision of re encountered earth neighborhoods in the near future and with the help of new technologies? And uh, what may be the major challenge in your view? Ipsita, your your connection broke up a little bit for me, but I think the question is about doing vision. Yeah. Um neighborhoods or mm -hmm. it's, it's in the chat right? um, yeah. <clears throat> oh, okay let's see um oh earth neighborhoods in the near future oh absolutely absolutely um the in fact i'm in several discussions about printing several um 
basically printing neighborhoods right now. And I, I feel very confident now after all these uh, research projects that it is totally possible. Um, so, and, and it seems novel. I mean, many uh, people in the audience might seem like, oh, this is, this is kind of a, a grand experiment, but about a third of the planet lives in neighborhoods made of earth. And so this is just employing a new tool. So this is absolutely my aspiration to see how this is produced at scale and how it's produced in ways that, again, accommodate to our 21st century ways of living. And those those ways of living are very diverse across the planet. But I, I feel like this technology allows us to be able to engage and do that in, in really um, specific ways because we can tailor the construction uh, to different ways of life and different cultural practices of life. Do you think uh, like it uh, in terms of affordability also, it can play a big role because mostly as you mentioned, the word construction, there are different uh, countries and even areas in the world. For example, in Africa, in terms of Cameroon, they have this kind of Nubian, Nubian wall constructions and, and in India as well, we have a lot of earth constructions happening. So, but it is now kind of getting focused in the rural areas. So do you think our technology and the way we are combining both architecture and the technology, can it help in affordable construction and printing houses for them, for the, that section of the community? Yes, absolutely. I think most people see um, earthen architecture in rural environments because they're celebrated as objects and they're places where this tradition is uh, very uh present and in the open, but there are countless cities around the world made out of earth um, in almost every country. You can find cities in the United States made out of earth. Uh, just up the road in Sonoma, that entire downtown is made out of earth. Um, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, Phoenix, uh, Tucson. Um, we can go to other countries in India and China and Afghanistan. There's enormous dense cities entirely made out of earth. And it's a it's an extremely affordable material. As I mentioned, 3D printed concrete is much more expensive than actual concrete. And earth is completely, for the most part, free. And so I believe the, the affordability is, is without without question. Um, again, I think it's the responsibility of designers, and on this case, the responsibility is on me to demonstrate how that is possible. And that's my aspiration. I have, I have not done that yet, but those are my goals, to demonstrate that um, and allow someone to imagine that someone could live in a building made of earth. And not only for poor people, not only for the poor, but for anyone. And this is, this is also my goal, because... Um, you know, I'm interested in a broad spectrum of populations who could uh, have the pleasure of living in buildings made of earth, but I, I I want to mostly convince that this is a this is a building material for contemporary 21st century living. I have one question from you. <clears throat> Considering that the concept is very sensitive to the physical conditions of sites such as climate, earthquake danger, and so on. What are the project's future horizons? I feel you have answered it a bit, but if you want to expand on your... Um, this is climate recognition. What are the project's yeah. future horizons? <clears throat> well, I think, the, you know, it, it, it falls within that blurry border between art and architecture. And so some of my future horizons are continuing to speculate on um, environments that are incredibly spatial and incredibly phenomenological, let's to use that architectural term, and are very, um, maybe in, in the tradition of the folly, like Skylos, for example, or Casa Covida can even fall into that, and are still research-based. And there's a great value in that. And I think the art world places, has they have placed a great value on this and have allowed me to fuel this research. The architecture community often wants to know what the bottom line is. And those are related to your questions like affordability, uh, speed, like who, who are the clients? 
Um, how, how inexpensive can this be? How fast can it be? And so there's a very, there's a much lower value than there because it starts to compete with uh, drywall, for example, and wood framing or, or CMU block construction. And so I'm aspiring to think about both those worlds and how those two worlds of art and architecture can sometimes bump up against each other, can overlap and, and also separate and to see where this, this journey uh, takes me. Um, I, I think I'm teaching a studio right now and the students did this incredible work because I've asked them to think about the hybrid conditions of, of how do you detail glass? How do you detail a concrete foundation? How do you detail a steel or wood roof or a truss system? And so these are details that have never been imagined in the history of architecture. And my students at Berkeley are imagining what these very fundamental architectural details are. How do you stick a window in a 3D printed earthen wall? And what is the possibilities of that? So that's a, a little bit of the future horizon of the project, just solving the pragmatic details and thinking about how those details expand our notions of of architecture. That's I can't maybe we could, yeah. we could ask sorry to uh, we asked Giovanna to uh Giovanna to, Giovanna's in, 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 in Peru, um so deep in South America. Giovanna. For sure. Thank you, Neil. And uh, no, thank you so much, Ronald. Uh, I'm very impressive with your work. Um for me I found very special your presentation and all your your research, um, because I I found uh, in your presentation more than one topic uh, in in com connection with how our heritage, how our culture in Peru works, um, with uh, constructions, with uh, the use of material, but not exactly with the technology. So for that. Um, I, I was thinking in like a, 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 a dream or a, like a utopic uh, possibility uh, in a near future to use your your your, your research to, to think in 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 share that type of, of combination between technology between the use of robotics uh, the the um, your your own construction of your your machine to to build and uh, maybe share that ideas with the with the world with the young world who, who is improving in the architecture career or the professional world uh, thinking in in how they can use uh, in in this year the technology to to build a better environment uh, for for landscapes where people continue using um, houses uh, who who was built with earth because in in the Anden of Peru people continue using be, uh, continue build their houses with with earth but mm -hmm. they. Uh, use the air with another type of material like you mentioned, for example, not exactly drywall, they use more like a calaminas in Spanish, like a, a metallic, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and obviously metallic is not the best for the the climate the, where they are. And we can see in your presentation how you uh, connect the idea of habitats and to be honest, uh, in in the Andean, the people don't need more than three spaces or three areas for living. So I found in all your research uh, more than one point, uh, a good point to share uh, with a young architects. Um, and I'm not sure what 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 is coming maybe for 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 you for for the research or. How do you see um, how we can uh, continue with 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 uh, I don't know developing your your idea? I know that maybe it's not your point, but I found a completely uh, good combination using the the technology 
uh, and thinking all always in in the heritage and in the people. I I found that you connect the idea of the culture that we have maybe in in Latin America um, that Ipsita uh, could connect with Indian or maybe um, other or other countries, but uh, I find completely connect with uh, the the Latin America people and your point with with Carita. So for that, what is coming? Let, let us know maybe who is your next point, your next steps. Yeah, thank you, Giovanna. Um, I I think I I really appreciate that you can connect to the work, and I I I believe that um, many people who are part of an earth building heritage practice can connect to it not only throughout Latin America but around the world. Someone in India watching this, or someone in China watching this, or someone in Afghanistan or the Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa can find a connection to this because it is so ubiquitous, these kinds of practices. They result in different ways and different kinds of forms and different kinds of environments, but we can see the similarities. So we, we sh I think in some ways we share this global heritage and this is something that we all have in, in common. I Sometimes when I'm in, in audiences, I ask people how many, pe how many in the audience has, have lived in a building made of earth and a small number of people might raise their hand and then I ask them about their parents and more people raise their hand and then I ask them about their grandparents and at least half of the audience sometimes will raise their hand and so we're just a few generations uh, unfamiliar with our connection with earth if we go back three generations to our grandparents generation we often find that uh, so many people were living in buildings made of earth, and we've we've forgotten that. We have a connection now more to buildings made out of aluminum extrusions and steel and glass and concrete. And it's very unfamiliar in our 10,000 years of history to live in buildings like this. So what's the future? If, you know, I have, I have goals for the future that I'm hoping to achieve related to 3D printing earth and architecture. But if I, if I think, um, about what is in place right now that I think will evolve is that this software that I created called Potterware, it's now in use in Tijuana, Mexico. It's used in Sudan. Uh, it's used by homeless youth here in Oakland. And it, we're going to do a pilot project in El Salvador. And so the the ability for people to have access to the, this technology is expanding um, beyond high schools and universities in the West. And these pilot projects are enabling people to use local soils and local clays to 3D print in these ways. And so I think that that expansion, which, which for my studio led to scaling the architecture, might allow me to deploy these technologies in other places so that others can have access to maybe scaling the architecture as well. These are, this is what I'm envisioning. I don't know if that all made sense, but I'm, I'm, I'm finding ways of planting seeds in other places where this, these ideas might grow. And I, I think it's really necessary because I, I believe that if we consider additive manufacturing to be one of the most advanced and novel forms of construction, I often question why we're using mostly a material of concrete, which has demonstrated 150 years of environmental de degradation on this planet. It doesn't make sense to me to take a step forward using what has brought us backward. And so I feel like Earth and this technology are going to move forward in really beautiful ways. Thanks, thanks. Thank Ron. you, Giovanna. Try, try and wrap up because this has been an incredible session. But, uh, um, uh, but Juan, I just want to say that 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 uh, you mentioned other countries. We we have. You'd be surprised how how far our reach goes. We regularly have yeah. uh, followers in in Baghdad, in Iraq, and and um, mm. in Kenya, and in uh, um, Bangladesh. Amazing. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's it'll be we 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 post everything onto our YouTube channel and it gets the, the views stack up over time.
I just wanted to mention one thing. I, I think what is so amazing about your work is you're you're obviously working with boundaries and definitions and breaking those down, both social and geo and economic and 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 political and 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 in all the, or everywhere. And I think the, the the world of art and and, tech, and science is completely broken down in, in in your work. But I also thought in a kind of interesting way the kind of temporal distinction between the past and the future is also broken down. I think there's something that we always forget is that the, the past and the future are totally connected, you know, and we we tend to think about the past as something that was in the past and it's ossified, mm. but it's a living tradition that can be kept alive. And, you know, someone, I worked in Alberta years ago, and he was a real revolutionary innovator in his time. And I think we, we tend to sort of misunderstand the past, uh, uh, but we should see it as a living tradition and to see it's connected to the future. There's a, a wonderful comment that uh, Wolf Pricks once made in, in one of his lectures, in two days time, tomorrow will be yesterday. Or you could say mm -hmm. tomorrow, today will be yesterday. But to understand this continuum that we are part of and we are contributing to. And I think your work is is, is so beautiful in the way, it, it, in, a, in a very intelligent and sensitive way and witty way, it breaks down those barriers that uh, have compartmentalized our ways of thinking and I think brings together architecture in a very holistic way. Um, so this was a fabulous, fabulous presentation, really a wonderful thing. Let me just simply finish off by uh, by showing, uh, just if Sita, can we maybe show the, just those those the slides of the, of the, the, um, uh, the, the last, so just to say that um, the, the, the previous sessions are, um, one was in Spanish, totally in Spanish. Uh, it's been uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Lydia Ratoy, especially working on conservation, well, on conservation with uh, traditional buildings, um, and then um, this last one on, on Spanish. And then uh, we, so that was the one in Spanish. Um, and then com uh, coming up soon, we have there's some tutorials, and we have one in. Uh, 3D printing for fashion um, involving some extremely talented um, and sensitive designers, uh, uh, Benas Farahi, Niklo Casas, Jenny Wu, Jessica Rosenkrantz, and Natalie Alima. Um, some very, very beautiful work. Um, Ron, this was fabulous. This was really um, incredible. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so nice to see someone who's thinking about the, the very core issues that we think about in digital futures, breaking down boundaries, sharing knowledge, um, and, uh, and opening up the world and trying to make the world a better place. Uh, that to my mind is architecture. It, it obviously involves building, but it's about making the world a better place. So thanks, Ron. It was a very, beautiful and sensitive session. Thank you so much indeed. And thank you also to the team behind this, to Ipsita, I'm not sure if it's in India now, but to Giovanna and to and, and to uh, Gustavo and Bavlin and all the other people, uh, Sara Kodarin in Digital Futures who have helped this make this happen. This has been a very, very special session. Thank you so much, Ron. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, for the opportunity and always your, your generosity and thoughtfulness. And thank you, everyone on the team. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Thank you so very much. Thank you.